So I'm going to be talking about the tutor, tutor learner connection today. Um, maybe I'll stand on this side. So um, my name is Nicole Manino Johnson. And um, a little bit about me. Um, when I was in high school, my grandmother passed away and my grandfather came to live with us. And we realized he didn't know how to read or write. And so he didn't couldn't pay his bills. Um, and so bills are piling up and he couldn't do the basic functioning of a household. And that was my introduction to adult basic education. Um, and also we are a family of, that descended from immigrants. Um, my grandfather wasn't an immigrant, but his parents were. Um, and so those two things together kind of have inspired me through my life to pursue a career in adult education. Um, currently I oversee um, our citizenship and digital literacy programs, um, and I create some custom cur curricula for employee training services. So today, um, this talk, we're going to increase our cultural awareness, just a smidge. Um, we'll identify some variances in educational backgrounds. We'll identify strategies to develop the tutor-learner partnership and we'll develop an individual tutor action plan. All right, so some of my slides will have a little icon like this. And this is just to prompt you to like, think about how this might apply to you or your student. Um, if you see a little pen, not sure if any of those are on there, but that'll be an action plan, something you might wanna try. And we'll have a little bit of discussion with a partner time. All right, so the first topic is cultural awareness. Um, so I just wanna hear from you if I ask you, what is culture, what comes to mind? Just yell it out. <laughs> How people think. How people think. Yep. Groggies. Groggies, okay. <laughs> yeah. The traditions. Traditions. Family. Family. Language. Language. Identity. Food. Identity, food, art, mm -hmm. art. Yep. So it's a really big word. It can encompass a lot. Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Come on in. There's seats up here. Okay. So I have a few definitions from literature. Um, one is it's the sum of the way of life of any group of four people. Pretty simple one. Um, it's membership in a community that shares a common social space and history and common imagining. <laughs> it's the way that every brain makes sense of the world. I really like this one. <laughs> um, I went forward. There we go. And think of it as the brains, it's the software for the brain's hardware. So it drives what we do. Okay. And it could be considered the collective mental programming of people in an environment. Those two are kind of similar. All right. So these are just some of the definitions I've come across in different literature that I've read about culture. So, culture is collective. Right? So, it's something that happens from membership in some sort of group. That group could be a national group, a country that you're from. It could be your family's culture. Um, it could be work culture. It, it's not just national identity that we're talking about. Um, it's learned. It's not static. So culture changes. Think of revolutions in the 1960s. Um, it's an unspoken guideline to behavior. And it encompasses our worldview and our values. These are the deeper things that we can identify as easily as growth. 
there's a couple models you might have seen. There's the onion model where in the middle are our values. And then there's some rituals and heroes and practices. And on the outside, we see symbols. So at the core are our worldview and our values. There's the iceberg model you might have seen where above the water, it's what we see here in touch. And then below the surface are our beliefs, our values, our thought patterns, myths that we hold. And this is a newer one for me. It's the culture tree. And I kind of like this one. Um, so on the leaves are the surface culture, things we can observe, songs, cooking, hairstyles, dance, stories. They call this middle part the shallow culture. So it's our concepts of time, the concepts of personal space. Um, we we span is important in, in cultures. It could be, yeah, yeah. Some Very cultures we want to be right pretty far apart. Other exactly. cultures are like to be closer. Um, I studied abroad in Madagascar, and we would go to the bank to exchange our money, um, and there wasn't like a line that you waited on. The whole everybody in there was like crowded to right, right behind you and I'm trying to get money it was really uncomfortable but that was culture there um so space was not an issue people wanted to be close um and then below the roots are the deep culture um and this is kind of how we think about how the world began these are our values this is our world view down here okay you can see here it's our core beliefs our worldview, our group values. And notice our little notice slide. Try to investigate your own culture. This is the first step that we can do um, to become more culturally, some people say competent or aware. Um, there's different terminology about it. Um, compassionate. All right. So once you kind of understand your own cultural beliefs, your own values, then you can start to understand cultural differences a little more. So we're going to look at just two different ways to examine cultural differences. Interdependence, so individualism versus collectivism, and time. P time, which we'll talk what that means, versus M time. Okay. So, individualism. These societies prefer a loosely knit social network. You're expected to take care of yourself. You're going to pull up your bootstraps. You're going to, you know, take care of business. You're taking care of your immediate family. And our self-image is de determined by I. Right. Collectivist societies, and this is broad strokes, right? There's a big spectrum in societies. So we're not going to just, there can be um, a big difference between individuals within a society. Collective societies prefer tightly knit framework. Um, individuals can expect their relatives or members in an in-group to look after them. And in exchange, they give them unquestioning loyalty. Okay. And we define our self-image in terms of we. So individualism prioritizes and values individual achievement. Okay. Self-reliance and education, self-study, reading learning for myself. Individual contributions, individual status are important. Individualist societies can be a bit competitive and tend to be more technical and analytical. Does this remind you of any society or culture in particular? Anybody? Yeah. US? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, there's been some large scale studies of um, comparing different cultures um, by examining IBM employees around the world. And the US is really high in individualism. 
There's also families that are multicultural within their own family. Unit. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's mine. Yeah. Yeah. So this is broad strokes, right? Um, the family unit is a little can be a lot more variable. We're a multicultural society. So and also depending on where in the US that you live. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So in collectivism, the priorities are the reliance on the group, taking care of each other to get ahead. Okay? Learning by dialogue and interaction rather than reading and self-study. It's relational, collective wisdom is valued, collaboration is valued, harmony is valued. And again, there can be a big spectrum from person to person, um, but these are some broad strokes to kind of help you compare where the core of somebody's values are coming from. And these are things that are hard to identify. You don't, you're not raised in like, I'm in an individualist society, I'm in an individualist, right? Um, Okay, so again, this is one big broad way of looking at individualism versus collectivism. There's a lot of studies about the differences between these two. And when people from these two different core values meet, things happen, right? We have different assumptions, okay? Um, <laughs> maybe in school, if you're in an individualist society, people are expected to do for themselves. If you have a problem, go to the teacher, go ask the teacher. Um, maybe someone in a more collectivist society, group work is valued, sharing with one another is not considered cheating, okay? Plagiarism views are different between individualist and collective societies, yeah. okay? So there's a lot of differences that can happen um, because of these deep-rooted things that we're not really even completely aware of. All right, concepts of time. I had mentioned earlier, I studied abroad in Madagascar. This is where I learned about this and it blew my mind and it helped me understand my father of all people. All right. <laughs> P time stands for polychronic time or flexible time. Relationships are central to P time. People are firmly in the here and now. It's a little less predictable. <laughs> Rescheduling is very common. The future is uncertain, it's unknowable, it's less important than right now. Teamwork is valued. Appointments are considered flexible meeting times. Okay. My dad growing up, he was a talker. He ran into, oh, you're my old friend, we're talking. Okay. I'm waiting at school for him to pick me up. Okay. But this is the most important interaction right now. Okay. Then when he's done with this conversation, because it would be rude to stop talking to you right now because I haven't seen you in a while, right? You wanna find out about your family and blah, 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 blah. When this is over, then I'll go to pick up my daughter. <laughs> She'll be there. Um, and I was there. Um, but it's a different way of looking at things, okay? Um, my sister's friend is from Jamaica and um, they go to church. Church doesn't start until everybody gets there. That's a Caribbean thing. Yeah, it's a Caribbean thing. Key time. <laughs> it's flexible. Okay, people are the most important. You can't start until everybody's there. And I know Hannah's coming eventually. <laughs> yep, she told me she was going to be here. Something must have happened. We'll wait for her to arrive then we'll start church, okay? That's P time. Um, P time cultures are characterized by a strong involvement with people. They emphasize completion of human transaction, okay? Human transaction is more important than keeping to a schedule. Two P time individuals deep in conversation will typically choose to arrive late for their next appointment rather than cut into the flow of the conversation. That would be rude. <laughs> Here's a quote from a book that I read from Usman Umar. He's from Ghana. He said, my concept of time was entirely different. If you asked me what I'd be doing five years in the future, I wouldn't know. 
Long-term planning is not a priority. My concern is what I'm gonna eat that day and whether I'd have anything to eat the next day, okay, right now. In Ghana, buses depart when they're full. There is no hurry. People wait until all the seats are taken. You can't make many plans because you're waiting for everyone to fill up the bus. And so after a length of time I can't quantify, we finally arrived in Naomi. This was my experience in Madagascar. You wait until the bus is full and then it goes, right? You're gonna get there sometime today, probably. <laughs> hey. Um, British culture tends to be more not in the P time, okay, not in P time. So um, a British businessman in Saudi Arabia wants to secure an important deal. He has a tight schedule. He can't afford to waste time. He's getting frustrated because he's waiting and waiting for his appointment with his Saudi partner. He's noticed meetings never start on time. There's frequent interruptions. People come into the meeting, they're interrupting, they're getting papers signed. The guy he's meeting with is answering the phone right in the middle of his meeting. He's frustrated, right? Um, what's happening here? Why is he so frustrated? Yeah, he, the British businessman is not in peace time. That's not his core value. He doesn't understand what's happening here. All right, M time is the opposite, linear monochronic time. We carefully plan and schedule. The conference starts at 9 a.m. We started at 9.03, we were a little late, all right? Um, punctuality and productivity are valued. Appointments are kept or they're canceled in advance. There's strict evaluation of progress and individuals focus on completing one project and then doing the next project and doing the next project. It's linear. So Akita from Nigeria said, Germans plan everything, not just weeks, but months in advance. Last week, three months before a conference, I got an email asking me to choose what I want for dinner on April 6th. <laughs> How can I possibly be expected to know what I'm gonna wanna eat in three months? <laughs> so, from someone coming out of P time, they're having that same culture shock that the M time people are having. All right. So here's an incident that we'll kind of discuss with a partner. Mario from Brazil will never forget the first time as a young manager, he was invited to his American boss's house for dinner. His boss and wife invited him and four other members of the team for 6 p.m. He carefully arrived at 6.35. What happened? The host is asking, I'm worried. Did you get lost? Are you stuck in traffic? Was there an accident? Is everything okay? Everyone was waiting and he was humiliated. All right. Talk with someone next to you. What happened here?
and Spanish. They wanted me to learn Spanish first, and I learned um, English in school quite rapidly. You know, young kids learn so fast. Yeah. And um, they thought I had a developmental problem because my last name was Delgadillo, and I would spell it different on each achievement test. So they wanted to put me in like the slow learner class. Yeah. Boy, were they wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, a, you know, I learned from home. From home. And for me, it was Atlanta. I went to an excellent school here in the city of Pittsburgh. My parents supported learning and help. And there's an expectation you would do something on your own, figure mm -hmm. it out. So, yeah. Lots of yeah. But the day one, they didn't expect you to figure it out for yourself, right? No. Right. No. You had some time in these right. ways of doing things. All right, so dependent learners rely on the teacher to carry the cognitive load. They're unsure how to do new things. Um, they require scaffolds. Okay, what do I mean by scaffold supports getting them from here to there. Um, they'll passively wait if they're stuck. Okay, they're not going to ask, maybe. You know? um, they have difficulty retaining information. Independent learners rely on the teacher temporarily for some of the cognitive load. They have strategies that they possess to tackle a new task. They attempt new tasks without the scaffolds. They use cognitive strategies to get unstuck. They're not just gonna wait around. And they've learned how to retrieve information from long-term memory. Okay. How did they become this independent learner? Because they had a lot of support. Okay. They were in a good school system. Um, they were believed in, they had family support, they had resources, okay? Dependent learners aren't like this because there's something inherently wrong with them, okay? Um, there's circumstances that led to this. All right, so a student wants to get their GED but persistently comes to sessions without having done any work at home. The tutor asks why they haven't done any work. The student says, I'm not good at this, I just don't get it put their head down and the tutor notice they're not really motivated the rest of the session, All right? What's happening here? Lost them. Lost them how? They're, they're just, just interested in trying. Mm -hmm. They don't have any self esteem to try. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think when you have a student like that, you got it, there's more going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a young guy from the blog and he was 12 hours a day. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. You know, he goes home. He's got a cook for five, six people. He's got church. But I think it's instilling in them that they so you have to really know your student to see what's going on. And someone and he was also on the border of mental ability. Okay. And lack of school. So you just gotta start doing the home and there are high schools now in this country. Where the kids come to school to do the homework with the teachers, and then at night they go on their laptops to learn the lesson. So you got to really think about what's going on, and sometimes you got to start at the very, very base of doing the homework to the start of the mm -hmm. praise or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, not always, but very often they lack the critical skill of being able to persist from the mistake. Yeah, they don't know what to do next. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have the tools and strategies, perhaps. Yeah, it's a failure. Um, yeah, they're just sitting and waiting for someone to help them. Yeah, it might be a mental health Maybe, yeah. Um, yep. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sometimes they don't relate it to other things. That they do. But, I mean, I try to get the students to think, <laughs> you know how to ride a bike. You learn how to ride a bike by reading about it. Yeah. 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 And play basketball or whatever else they do. They try to tie it like that. Um, where there's some requirement for them to. Absolutely. To yeah, that's a great example. It's relating it to something they do know. Okay. Our students aren't stupid. There's nothing wrong with them. They just don't have a background that matches what they're doing in that session. So, one of the things that I had a conversation with somebody somewhere recently is in math, how do we often teach fractions? Right? In math, right? 
What if you come from a culture where you don't measure? Fractions aren't going to exist. You, you know, yeah. pinch of salt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But my model's always measured. So it makes a lot of sense to me. But for my students who've never measured in their life, that's not going to relate. That's a great, great example. Yep. And here we have a Native American student didn't know a lot about World War II history, and they didn't like studying history at school. Okay. The tutors suggest that they do some internet research and make a slideshow to present it. This student really enjoys making presentations and is good at that. The student came back the next week excited to share their presentation on World War II code talkers. Okay. What happened here? Found a strength. Yeah. The student really enjoyed the presentation, so the tutor directed him to do something that they were good at. Okay. Yes. You got to understand some cultures. There's generational trauma, so if you're in the Caribbean, you never bring up, you know, that you're slave. Right. They are very uncomfortable talking about it, mm -hmm. and for Native Americans. Their trauma is so deep that mm -hmm. I taught on the Chippewa Cree of Montana. So that's really, really hard. It is. Yeah. You know, everybody, you know, they're all traumatized. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something to consider. Um, but sometimes you have to do things like that. If they want to pass a GED, there's going to be some questions about this kind of thing. So um, this tutor was smart. They, they found a strength, and the student talked about the code talkers, which are Navajo, um, and how they were involved. And so that helps culturally bridge a divide here. They're learning what they need to learn, and they're using their strengths. All right, so the learning partnership, helping learners move from dependence to independence, um, teach the strategies for learning. Don't assume that they know how to learn. Use cultural knowledge as a scaffold to new concepts. Build trust, okay? And create a connection with your student. The relationship is important. The individual relationship is important. They need that individual. And I think, I've only been to, what, to four classes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really new at this. Mm -hmm. um, and I was brought in because I had experience in teaching ESL. And they had one student in art, the group that uh, they thought had a language problem, but it, he was never even raised in the Mexican culture. He was black and the, oh, the Mexican father. And so the core of his problem was confidence. Mm -hmm. And he is a slow learner in reading. And by talking to him, I found out what his interests were. And I got him interested in some, I brought books in for him on culture to mm -hmm. help him read. You know, just, I think it's so important to find out what that core, that nut is that you need to crack. Yes, making it relevant, right? Yeah. But what are the what is the person like? Yep. Um, leveraging student strengths. We talked about this a little bit. Um, strengths based education is a learner centered approach to teaching that helps students identify, articulate, and apply their skills. Um, and it helps. This helps build confidence. Um, but how do you know what their strengths are? First, you need that relationship, right? So building the relationship is the first part of it. Get to know this person. Ask them, what do they think their strengths are? What can you do well? Um, you talked about, you know how to ride a bike, right? That's looking at strengths. They've done something before. You've done that before. You did practice and you kept going, okay? That's a way of finding out strengths. You're building your relationship. You're finding out what they're interested in, what they're good at. And then you're using those, you're leveraging those strengths so that they can tackle new skills. All right, set goals together, all right? Identify learning targets that allow the student to experience both success and challenge. Don't be afraid to challenge students, um, but challenge without shutting down. You don't wanna give them something too hard, right? Um, together, select a learning goal. Select one that's small, specific, and significant. Set a deadline and some benchmarks. How do we know we got here? Be explicit about how you're going to support the student. What are you willing to do to help them? And ask them what they're gonna do to get there. 
Okay, this is a conversation. It's part of your relationship. It's a partnership. Ask them to identify anything that might be in the way. Okay. I had a bad experience in school before. I hate school. Why do you hate school? Right. What's in the way? I work. I have a family. I have five kids. I have to. I don't have a lot of time. You know. So ask them to identify the barriers. Incorporate time for periodic check-ins and create some kind of ritual to mark the occasion when they've achieved this small goal. It could be something small, a fist bump. Um, it could be a little, I don't know, special pen or something. All right, provide feedback. Um, so neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change and grow. Feedback helps this happen. Okay. When students use feedback and are able to improve performance or understanding, it triggers the reward center and releases dopamine. They like that feeling, the brain grows, okay? They're gonna be more likely to apply effort and stick with it if they have that chemical running through their body. They're enjoying this now. They did something well, the brain responds. All right, so feedback. This can be hard <laughs> to do. Um, there's instructive, corrective feedback, advice, but not really actionable and evaluative, but not instructive. So good job, it's positive, okay? You need more examples in your report. It's getting a little closer. Um, in the third sentence, you use the wrong punctuation and you have a run-on sentence. Okay, I know what to do now. I've gotta to go to the third sentence and fix it, all right? This is a C paper, <laughs> not so helpful. Um, fix your run-on sentences but where are they? Okay. When you added X to the equation, you didn't follow the correct procedure. Okay, I can go to that equation where I added X and figure out what to do now. I know where to go. Your addition is sloppy, not so helpful. Um, provide more evidence in your paper. Where? Okay. When you're adding two columns of numbers, you're forgetting to carry the number over. Ah, okay. Now I can, every time I'm adding two columns of numbers, I can see my mistake and go correct it. So instructive feedback is actionable, specific, timely, and supportive. Actionable means it's focused on correcting an explicit aspect of student performance. It's not vague. It's not correct your run-on sentences. It's on the third sentence, you have a, fragment or you have a run on, go look at that. It's clear exactly what needs work, okay? Specific, focus on one or two points that are related to the goal. Pointing out too many errors is overwhelming and could make people shut down. Timely, it's relevant to recent learning. It's, it's related to their goals. And finally, supportive, low stress delivery, Feedback demonstrates you're listening and it's building trust, okay? We're not gonna be like, no, <laughs> you're doing this wrong. Okay, we want it to be a little more low stress, okay? Wow, I love what you did about these Native American co-talkers. I noticed on slide four, um, you forgot to put a reference or you know whatever it was. Then they can go back to slide four and correct that mistake, but it's low stress. Right? They know that you were listening. They know you looked at their presentation. Um, all right. So this student has a goal to learn to use correct punctuation when writing an email. Their homework is to send you an email with correct punctuation. You get the message. There's a few mistakes with commas, but you also notice spelling and a lack of clarity. How, what kind of feedback could you give this person? That's what the goal is. Right. So don't attack everything. Tell them about the commas, ignore everything else, right? The goal was correct punctuation here. All right, so resources for you. Um, a lot of this is based on culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Um, there's also a great site on Edutopia about getting started with culturally responsive teaching. Oops. MALP is that mutually adaptive learning paradigm that helps with um, the students is limited and interrupted formal education. Learner variability navigator. Um, do I have time to look at this? Or do you have 
have uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So we're gonna look at this quickly here. That's where I wanna go. Sorry about that. Stop share. Okay. I think the PowerPoint is still in screen share. Which one was it? It was this one. There we go. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So the Digital Promise um, has this, this project called the Learner Variability Project. And it's pretty cool once you get the knack of it. Um, so the learning learner variability, blah, variability navigator um, is where you can choose a model. So it has like anything from K through 12, and then there's an adult learner model, um, which is what we'll look at. And you can identify factors that might be affecting the student or the progress, and they'll give you some resources with strategies. Okay, so if I go here to choose my model, I'm gonna go to adult learner, and I'm gonna explore some factors. Okay. So my learner has some adverse experiences with school. Okay, and I can tell you a little bit about what might be going on, okay? Um, for strategies, this is where I usually start because you can choose your factors, okay? They've had some adverse experiences. Um, there's emotional something going on there. They have some problems with attention, okay? So that's a site that we could use. Yep. And then it's going to give you some strategies to use based on the factors that you choose. Okay. So, oh, okay. It gave me those strategies. So, with this learner annotating, learners engage deeply with the text and make their thinking visible while reading. So, if I click on that annotating, it's going to tell me about this strategy and how to use it and giving examples of what this might look like, okay? So it's really specific examples and different websites you can use to help your particular learner and um, where, meet them where they are, okay? Um, so highly recommend this one. Um, I know. <laughs> Okay. Okay, there's a bibliography which can be shared later, um, but I got a lot of this from a couple of books that I really like. Um, Crossing Cultures in the Language Classroom. This one's really good if you have an English language learner that's from another culture. And this was the Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. These are both excellent resources. I have them up here if you want to flip through those. Um, and there's some other places that you can go to learn more. Okay, so for your action plan, think about what do I want to learn more about? Okay, what questions do I have? What tools would I like to explore a little more? And then some tips, take some bite-sized actions. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Okay, try one or two strategies. Um, collaborate with other tutors to see how it's going with them and their students and incorporate some time for reflection. After I teach, I like to think, what went well, what didn't go well, um, especially if there's like a, an issue that happened, what could I do differently next time? Or, you know, um, maybe, ooh, wow, I'm really realizing this person um, doesn't have the strategies to learn. How can I teach them how to learn? And then you could go to that learner variability project and find some tools to help you. You can ask your coordinator for some help. Um, and um, finally, what's something that you enjoyed or learned today? Okay. Anyone wanna share? I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, 
I've only ever done this one on one. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate with two students that were then once I asked them about their goals and visions, family, they, they have both immediately told me if I make a mistake, just correct me immediately. Mm -hmm. Boy, has that saved a lot of time guessing? Yeah. I mean, they went to that ground rule for themselves like very proactively. Is that normal? Uh, again, I know that the norm, that's a great example of you built a relationship and you made goals together. I, so I you asked. With it's the first 10 minutes. Yeah. I have never met or known these people before. I got the background from Barry, but that's all I read. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first lady was from, I don't know how to pronounce it, Mumbai, India, but. And the second gentleman was from Nina Peru. So, yeah, I mean, that's wonderful. And they that's, were both older. They both yeah. had a lot of life experience. And mm -hmm. I guess it was important enough to them, that, I guess, to save time. Yeah. A lot of students want correction. You know, yeah, I, they I, do that, want that it. That just threw me back. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> I said, I didn't know them. Anybody was yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's unique about this whole program here and the students that we have? Unlike, say, high school students, public schools, our students all want to be, they want to learn. They're yeah. doing this voluntarily. Yeah. And it changes everything as far as the yeah. gratitude and respect for the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of the literature is based on K through 12. So that's what I like about the Learner Variability Project. You can focus on resources geared toward adult learners um, because it is true. The students here came here of their own volition. They're not forced to be here. That helps a lot. We have time for like one more comment. I think that underpinning all of this is respect for the individual and making an effort to understand what they've been through and yeah. what they need. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your tutor conference today.